Hello everybody, welcome to Movie Libertas. How are you all doing? This is a new podcast on my Logan for Liberty channel. Um, I know my channel initially started out as a political channel, but I've been contemplating a lot of stuff. For th- for those of you who haven't been here since the beginning, and most of you haven't, most of you I think hopped on when it was still Renegade Slogan Media. I've changed the name five times, trying to figure out, you know, how I wanted to market it, market it as far as the name goes. Uh, I've had names, my channel name has been the Radical Republican, Radical Constitutionalist, uh, Slogan of Logan, Renegade Slogan Media, and now Logan for Liberty, and Logan for Liberty is staying, simply because, obviously, it's a political-oriented channel where I talk about the ideas of liberty, whether that be libertarianism, constitutionalism, anarchism, minarchism, objectivism, whatever, whatever you want to call it. The fundamental idea is liberty, which is what I believe in. But first of all, it's my channel, which is even more important, in my opinion, than uh, politics and the idea of, of liberty. It's, it's my channel. So, I want the channel to be more geared around me. So, if I want to talk about movies, that's what I'm going to do. Because I have a resounding love for movies. I consider myself a movie connoisseur. And I'm not trying to be... I'm being genuine. I'm not trying to you know, be pretentious. When I, Ever since I was a kid, there's been one thing that I've always wanted to do in my entire life. And that was, I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a movie director. I wanted to make movies. And I think that has always been a thing. If, if As far as I can go back and think, that's always been a dream of mine since I was in fifth grade. Since I was in fifth grade, I've always wanted to make movies. And now I'm 22 years old. And that's still something I've always wanted to do, but there's a lot of reason. Making a movie is very difficult, especially if you live in a rural town. It's still something I want to do, still something I'm going to do. So, over the years, throughout my elementary school years, the rest of them anyway, my junior high school years, my high school years, I've always just paid attention to the minutia of movies, the small details, every intricate part that makes a movie great. And there's many different facets that make a single movie awesome. Um, I think the beginning and middle section of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies are some of the best Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Um, When I think... They were really the pinnacle of f- modern day filmmaking in a way, but that that's not it. That that's a mainstream corporate type stuff. Well, I I mean I don't mind corporate type stuff. I'm not a hipster. Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight trilogy. I think those are some of the best films to exist. Uh, Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down. Obviously, some of the more classic movies like Halloween 1978 has always been something I was infatuated by, something that's always fascinated me. John Carpenter's The Thing. Alien. Aliens. All great movies. Uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. I've always paid attention to oh, the original Star Wars trilogy, especially The Empire Strikes Back. Those are the more mainstream movies that I love. There there are some smaller studio, more... Well, Halloween started out as an independent film, so I count that as an independent film. Even if it's mainstream now. I, I like seeing independent stuff have success. Anyway, this is still a political channel. But this is going to be a specific podcast or show where I talk about movies that I love. I haven't decided if I'm going to do movie reviews or, or stuff like that. I have made, I think, three other videos previous to this one. Predecessors to this video. One, I think, was called Movies Mean Something. And in that, I basically explain how 
there is an overall theme that a movie has. It has philosoph philosophical inquiries that it dives into. And I divided up, you know, what I see are three different categories. Sometimes that cross over and make a Triven di tri diagram. I think it's called a Triven diagram. A three ring Venn diagram or something like that. Or it's Venn 2, I don't know. Three ring diagram. Venn diagram. I'm going to call it Venn diagram. And I felt like I said that these movies fall into three categories. They can fall into a popcorn flick, which I think is what most of the MCU movies are, or superhero movies. Or, no, that's a movie like 2012. That's a popcorn flick. And then you have propaganda. And then you have art. And then sometimes you get a crossover between those three. Um, I made another video where I talk about the concept of pure evil. Uh, the allegory behind John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween. And I talk about the, the main antagonist of that movie. Who I say is... In that movie they refer to as the Boogeyman. And the Boogeyman is a cultural story that's meant to skill children and what the boogeyman is changes from culture to culture it changes from parent to parent and it changes it manifests itself in different ways in a kid's mind and that's essentially the character of michael myers he has a pale blank mask which is amorphous in a way it, it it's just a silhouette of a man meaning it could really be anything i also made I think the third one, which was um, that Star Wars is more conservative than you think. And that was, of course, a response to the controversy surrounding Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Uh, hold on a second. Let me unscrew this from my microphone because I'm holding my microphone. <clears throat> my voice is still a little messed up right now. I just woke up, so... I'm in that sort of, you know, half awake state. So, let me get to the thesis of the video, of this podcast. Which is, you shouldn't let movie critics decide how you feel about a movie. Today, around 2 o'clock, around 2 or 6 o'clock, I am going to go see Joker. I am excited for that movie. Now, the, the, I have mixed feelings about comic book movies not following the source material very close or taking certain liberties with the source material that's supposed to be based on, but I can give it, I allow it some leeway, I can excuse it if the movie looks good, and Joker looks like an interesting movie that is going to satisfy my movie going needs. It just looks fun. And it looks like a great, provoking, profound film. I have high expectations for it. And I hope my expectations are met. Or at the very least, I hope it's just a decent movie. But I'm excited to see it, nonetheless. So, I'm going to see it tonight. But as we all know, there's been some controversy around that movie. There's been a controversy around a lot of movies. But today, specifically, I wanted to talk about how, uh, the critics and why you shouldn't let the critics score, especially in Rotten Tomatoes, affect the way or affect your decision to go see a movie. So this is the way I think sometimes. Because I, I check Rotten Tomatoes scores if there's several movies playing at a movie theater that I want to go to. And I'm deciding, okay, I want to see a certain movie. Or I want to see a movie, I just don't know which movie. And... Sometimes it's a dichotomy. There's two choices. Sometimes there's more. So obviously, you know, I'll read the plot line, which one interests me the most. I'll watch movie trailers to see, you know, which one looks more interesting. But of course, a, a bad trailer can tank a good movie. And a good trailer can increase your expectations more than your expectations should be increased. Because it turns out the movie is trash. There are a few movies, like, uh, I think it's a Brawl on Cell Block 99 or something like that. The movie with Vince Vaughn the, and um, Concrete. Is that the movie with Vince Vaughn and uh, Mel Gibson? Drag Across Concrete. There we go. 
the movie trailers for those movies, because those two movies are made by the same company, but for some reason, in my opinion, the trailers for those movies are trash. But those movies are fantastic. So sometimes that doesn't work. So a third option, in order to influence my thinking, to help me make a decision, to give, you know, to give myself more uh, information to make a decision on, I go and look at the the scores, the critic scores, the audience scores. And Rotten Tomatoes is one of those websites I go to, if not the one that I rely on the most. Because not only do you get a critic's score, you also get the audience score, and it's easier to navigate than other uh, movie aggregate review websites. But sometimes you have this amazing deviation between what the critics think and what the audience thinks. And I'll get into some examples. Now, <clears throat> right now I'm trying to, I'm contemplating whether or not I want to get into my feelings about movie critics, or if I just want to go into some examples of what I'm talking about. Well, let me just go over the more controversial ones. So the first, well, I guess technically, yeah, most of these are all controversial movies. All right, let's go. One recent example. This is kind of a topical, I mean, I'm kind of past the point of where this was topical, but we're on the tail end of the topical conversation about critics being motivated by their beliefs, by agendas. So, Dave Chappelle's Sticks and Stones. Sticks and Stones. The critics' consensus on Rotten Tomatoes is edgy, but empty. Sticks and Stones won't break any bones, but it won't elicit many laughs either. Now, I watched it. I didn't think it was that funny. I think it's funnier than what the critics think it is. I don't think it's as funny as um, the consensus of the audience seems to think it is. But I also think that the audience was motivated by not only what the critics, the critics panning it, and therefore they felt like they had to, you know, backlash, they had to rebel against, they had to resist against the critics. But a lot of Dave Chappelle fan, uh, fanboys were already fanboys were, of course, watching. And, of course, some of his fan, fanboys are probably going to think... Anything that he releases is absolutely funny. But, as we all know, the critic score right now, the aggregate, which they only counted 17 critics. And I'm bringing that up because I'm going to bring that up later. Every other movie, TV show, usually has more than 17 critics that they aggregate their reviews from. <clears throat> their uh, percentage from. So the critic score is 35%. The audience score is 99% with 38,282 people giving review. So what's going on there? It seems to be uh, politically motivated. So let's read some of the reviews. Uh, Sticks and Stones registers as a temper tantrum, the product of a man who wants it all. Money, fame, influence without much having to answer to anyone. Okay. Why is that a review? Like, what? Okay, you, you could say it registers as a temper tantrum, as in he's going up and lecturing somebody. But the product of a man who wants it all, money, fame, influence, why is that a negative thing? And this is coming from a top critic from The Atlantic. Why don't you go work for a smaller newspaper? One that has less influence. One that will give you less fame, one that will pay you less, so you get fewer, fewer dollar bills, fewer dollar, 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 dollar bills, than what you're getting now, oh, because you're a woman who, who, who wants money, you want fame, you want influence, what is a critic, if not somebody, who wants to get paid, who wants a certain amount of fame, so they can inf influence people, so we go down to Roger Moore. You have our attention, pal. You just haven't delivered the funny. He gave it a 1.5 out of 4 from his personal rating system. 
obviously, you know, taking after the Roger Ebert sort of score. <clears throat> Six and Stones leaves the audience with the sense that there is more work to be done before the special is filmed. I mean, okay. Fair enough. What else? Sticks and Stones exist as a defiant design. Oh, here we go. This one cracks me up. This one is one of the most egregious reviews, in my opinion. Lacking empathy can certainly be amusing, but Sticks and Stones is a tired routine by a man who forgot to layer jokes into his act. Too often sound like a pundit on Fox News. So, out of curiosity, why Fox News? Why not CNN? Why not MSNBC? Why not NBC? Why not CBS? Why not The Daily Show? Why, why not one of these late night comedy shows? Why is it a pundit from Fox News? And by the way, this is clearly somebody who has never, ever watched Fox News or Fox Business. I remember when the Red Eye show was on. Uh, both under Greg Gutfeld, Gutfeld and Tom Shalhoub. They didn't sound like a typical pundit. It was more comedy-oriented shows. Now, sure, it was on 2 a.m., but you can find those episodes on YouTube. Some of them have been viral. If you're political like this person is, I guarantee you've probably seen at least one Red Eye video on the internet simply because they have a variety of people on they have their resident liberal at fox news just cut our love on they have your anarchist who went to north korea michael malice they've had him on they've had governor gary johnson on they've had congressmen they've had comedians they've had dave smith they've had kennedy <clears throat> sorry i don't know what's wrong with my voice i know that's annoying during a podcast sorry this is it's it's hilarious. Saying lacking empathy can be certain, or uh, yeah, lacking empathy can certainly be amusing. He showed empathy in his comedy special, specifically when he talked about abortion. It's a joke, and sometimes the the punchline of a joke is the fact that the person telling the joke doesn't have any empathy. And that's the point, because it's funny that this person is so out of touch that they don't have empathy for what they're criticizing. Um, like dropping in on a rascally uncle who doesn't know or doesn't care how much he's disappointing you. This comes from a woman. Um, and th this is interesting because oh, when you're talking about your uncle, there's two context, two negative contexts in which uncles are talked about. There's the one that I wish not to go into, which I think we all know, which is kind of gross. And then there's the one which this is probably talking about where it's like, oh, you know, your racist uncle at Thanksgiving. That's what that sounds like. <clears throat> so, yeah. I mean, they could think whatever they want about Dave Chappelle, Sticks and Stones. I personally don't have... I, I didn't think that this special was particularly funny when it came out in August. But what I want to know is, why is there such a deviation between the 35% Rotten Tomato score for critics... In the audience. So let's move on to the next example. Let's get this podcast rolling even farther. Because I kind of got stuck there. Another controversial movie. Captain Marvel. This was marketed as one of the best Marvel movies ever. Finally, we have a woman superhero. Film. Like, okay, nobody remembered Catwoman. Now, Catwoman was a terrible movie. Fair enough. But Wonder Woman... It seems like a pretty, uh, pretty successful superhero movie. And I'm not gonna go into that. That's, that's beating a dead horse. Anyway, this movie, when I saw the trailer, I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. The movie seems pretty good. I'm gonna go see it. I was like, I, I wonder. Oh yeah, I was seeing Venom with one of my buddies, and we were sitting in the front row, 
I hadn't, I hadn't seen it at this point, and he goes, oh yeah, no, this is a good movie, man. I heard, I heard that was a good movie. Watched it, laughed during some parts, loved Venom. But I remember before the movie, Captain Marvel came on, and I leaned over to my buddy, and I said, hey, that looks like a pretty good movie. I'm kind of excited for that. He goes, oh yeah, me too. And then Brie Larson, the actress, started saying some really inflammatory anti-men, anti-conservative stuff. This isn't a movie for white males or for males. And she let her political, you know, um, opinions known. Which I was like, okay, whatever. That doesn't mean the movie's not going to be good. It just means Brie Larson is kind of a piece of crap. But then it just got worse and worse, started seeing more shots of the movie, uh, saw a leak of that controversial scene where she basically murders a guy, which made her a villain, and I was like, okay, well that's a little, they're supposed to be heroic, you know, even the superheroes that kill people are heroic, because they're killing obvious bad guys, this guy, sure, he was a little creepy, he told you to smile, but if anything, that comes off more annoying. That's like walking down the street, somebody tells you to smile, so you pull a shotgun out, blast their fucking head off. That's what that scene felt like. She burned the person to death by electrocuting him. What the fuck? Anyway. The critics' consensus is that it is a 78%... It has a 78% Rotten Tomatoes rating. That's the aggregate store, score from 496 critics. What about the audience score? What, how does the audience feel about it? Oh, 54% audience score. What's happening there? Is there something a little politically motivated? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say so. Um, Let me see what I'm trying to find here. Uh, let's see the fresh... Scores. Uh, <laughs> Brie Larson is a square-jawed badass. Fair enough. Alright, let's move on to the next movie. And a movie that I find interesting. Because I found this... Mo I'm going to compare this movie to Captain Marvel a lot. And you'll find out why. But I thought this movie was a hundred times more competent... Than Captain Marvel. It was interesting. It was funny. It, it had some moments that I genuinely felt. You know, I felt some intensity. I, I felt what they were trying to give me. I felt for the main character. This movie's Venom. And guess what? 29% critics rating on Rotten Tomatoes from 332 critics. The audience score, 80%. Why is that? I never understood any hate for Venom. You can say it deviates from the comics. Okay, whatever. That's fine. You can dislike it for that. But how is it as a movie outside of source material? It's a competent movie. Tom Hardy is a great actor. Some of his best movies is The Dark Knight Rises and Warrior. And I thought he was great in Dunkirk. Christopher Nolan knows how to use Tom Hardy, in my opinion. He knows how to get a good range out of him. He could play a brooding villain. Or he could play a war hero. What? Why is... Why did 70... On Rotten Tomatoes, the aggregate score... Or why, why do critics like Captain Marvel, but not Venom? When Venom is so obviously a superior movie. I don't know, does, does Sony have, like, this curse where all their movies are just panned by the critics? I have no idea. All I know is that there's something weird going on there. So let's go to another controversial film. Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Now, we all know how this turned out. The critic score. 91%. The audience score. 44%. Well, don't worry about the audience score because that's Russian bots <laughs> and white supremacist groups. Okay. The main characters are still white. The good guys are still white. Luke Skywalker's still white. Uh, Rey is white. Princess Leia is white. 
Poe is light enough skinned to where he could pass for white. I don't think anybody's that concerned about whether or not white people are represented or whether or not white people are good guys. It has nothing to do with white supremacism. The movie was visually amazing. In my opinion. <clears throat> the story was trash. It didn't even feel like a sequel to The Force Awakens. Now, The Force Awakens was a good movie. It wasn't as creative as we would have liked to be. It suffered from that J.J. Abrams sort of thing where he he's more of a product of the movies he grew up on than he is inspired by the movies he grew up on. He's basically recreating the stuff that he loved. And so it kind of feels like, oh, I've, I've already seen this. And The Force Awakens is 75% A New Hope. But where it was different was amazing. The way it looked was amazing. The new things it interested was amazing. And after having the prequel trilogy, that was my cat sneezing, after uh, having the prequel trilogy, it was nice to get something familiar again. I liked the prequel trilogy, but that's how I think how most original trilogy fans felt. And the critics in the audience agreed on that, but The Last Jedi was terrible compared to that. So let's go on to another controversial movie. These two are together because one is, well, we'll just, whatever. Uh, let me just get into it. Ad Astra, the movie with Brad Pitt, right? <clears throat> uh, the Rotten Tomatoes score for critics, 83%. For the audience, 40%. What's happening there? Why is there such a deviation between... The critics and the audience. How does this happen? Um, let me let me find. What does the audience have to say? Let me find some bad scores. Oh, it's not giving me the bad scores. Here we go. This movie was like waiting at the DMV. Wow, why did the critics like this? Obviously, the masses didn't. Incredibly boring. First movie that ever made me walk out of the cinema. Killer space baboons. Are thing this movie enough said. <laughs> Boring and pointless. Visually stunning. I hate walking out of a theater feeling like I've wasted my time. Some amazing visuals, but unfortunately the storytelling here couldn't be more flat. The film left me cold. I wanted to like it, but I felt like it was a waste of time and money. So poor on so many levels. Um, although Brad is easy on the eyes, this movie was slow and boring. There are a few uh, action scenes, but otherwise... But, so... <clears throat> What's going on here? It, is there something about the critics that make them more that make them have more acuity to slower burn movies? I like slower burn movies, and there's a lot of slower burn movies that people like. So let's go on to the next one. Rambo Last Blood. Rotten Tomato score for the audience. Twenty seven not audience, uh critics. Twenty seven percent. Audience eighty three percent. What's happening? What, what, I mean, okay, but let's read what the critics say. Now, this one is highlighting exactly what I want to say. So, this movie is, has come out, you know, after the last movies, and this is kind of where the critics are showing their hands. Um, okay, so top critic from Film Week. NPR, Los Angeles. Racist, in addition to being offensive, in his sadism. Sadism. You know, uh, getting a turn on from pain is what sadism is. You know, some sort of sexual pleasure from pain. Yeah, this is from a woman named Claudia Puig, Puig, Pug. This review was left yesterday, or made yesterday in filming. Racist, in addition to being offensive, in his sadism. Um, gross, stupid, sleazy, exploitative, and almost certainly falsely titled. If it's gross, sleazy, and exploitative, how is it falsely titled if it's... Anyway. Uh... But are you noticing a trend from some of these critics... 
Sylvester Stallone's terrible acting is in line with the deplorable tone of the film. Tell me that that's not politically motivated. I mean, to be fair, this from Costa Rica, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> now, I am finding the ones that are more politically motivated, but there seems to be more than there should be. If Ted Kutchev, if, if the Ted Kutchev movie had a gloomy vision of the American dream, here it is. <clears throat> um, here, here it is difficult to collaborate any subtext. <clears throat> it's silly, offensive, and extremely violent, but with a certain style and swagger, if you like this sort of thing. Um... It's just kind of mediocre. Gruesome and simplistic. Oh, here we go. Rambo, The Last Blood is uncut geriatric is xenophobia. Why? Because he's killing Mexican drug cartels? That's xenophobia? Fucking A. And you know, that's really, that's relevant to modern times because Donald Trump's talking about the wall. Whether or not you agree with it, I certainly disagree with the wall. But one of the accusations, if you are for stronger borders, is that you're a xenophobe. And my answer is, is maybe some of them are xenophobes, but maybe there's actually something to the argument. But they're drug cartels. Are we defending drug cartels now? Now, I do think we should legalize all drugs. That is my more liberty-oriented decision for various reasons. I'm not going to get into that because this isn't a podcast where I'm trying to tell you why certain political... Uh, ideologies, tenets, or solutions are superior than others. But why is it xenophobic? Because the antagonists are Mexicans? Go fuck off. Tell me that's not motivated. This is from Book and Film Globe. <laughs> Disappointment bland. Do, 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 do. Let me find one more. I mean, this is what happens when I, I didn't pick the comments before. And some of these are like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, well, I mean, they're all basically, you know, it looks like upper culture type of, I hate this movie because I believe in high culture. You know, this movie is for the peasants. This is for the decadence. The people who live in decadence. Uh, Last Blood is a swing into straight exploitation movie territory. And that's what Rambo has always been. You've people got their limbs shot off. Uh, it's cheap and lazy stuff. Rambo is always a pro. Here we go. Rambo was always a product of Republican policy and his sore loser crybaby murder fantasy is a daringly accurate reflection of the state of the Republican Party circa 2019. I think that reviews like these should never be considered for the aggregate score. These are politically motivated reviews. These movie critics, they watch these movies, they watch a movie like this, and all they see is politics. All they see is Donald Trump this, Donald Trump that, Republican this, Republican that, racism this, racism that. Xenophobic movie makers these days are making movies that are pandering to the Republican masses about their violent fantasies about killing Mexicans. That's what these sound like. It's absurd. It's over the top. Why are these considered? These are critics. These are supposed to be professionals. And this is what I'll get into. So let's go to the movie Hustlers. What is the movie Hustlers? Well, it's a really powerful feminist movie. It talks about sex work. Therefore, it has a nice left-wing message. So, of course, it has an 88% from the critics. But what about the audience? 66%. Now, 66%, I consider a score that is decent. Anything above 60% 6, and above is a movie that I... Like, if I'm... Alright, so here, here. If I have movie A, movie B that I want to go see in theaters, I'm going to go look at the Rotten Tomato score. If one is a 76%, 
all right, I'm probably going to see that. If one's a 66%, I might pass it over and go to the 76% one. With that being said, if they're both 66%, I still might go see it in the theaters if I if I want to go see it. For example, I think the Joker right now has a 70% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Actually, it's right here. Let me check. Yeah, 70% rating from the critics on Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, that's fine. I'm still going to go see it. So, Hustlers, I'm, I might see it. I don't know. But why is there that deviation? So, let's go over to a movie by Ridley Scott. <clears throat> so, this movie has a deviation of 12% between the critics and the audience. This movie is Black Hawk Down from 2001. The, the critics think that... So, this is getting away from the politically motivated aspect of the critics. Because my, my theme wasn't that critics are politically motivated. My theme, my thesis, is that you should not let critics dictate or influence whether or not you like a movie, whether or not you should go see a movie. I'm not saying you shouldn't consider it. I'm just saying you shouldn't let them be the entire sole reason why you don't go see a movie or like a movie. So this is Black Hawk Down 2001 film by Ridley Scott based on the book Black Hawk Down, which is based on the uh, real life event that happened in Mogadishu, Somalia during the Somalian Civil War and the American intervention in it. <clears throat> the critic score is 76%. Audience score is an 88%. And in my opinion, the audience is right. A little closer to right. I'd give this like a... I think this is almost a perfect movie. But it, it's bloody. It's violence. I get why people didn't like it. But... Yeah. Why, why is there a deviation? Is it because critics, again, know better? <laughs> than uh, the audience. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, let's see some of the reviews. Todd McCarthy. A relentless immersion in combat. Strikingly realized. But none too pleasurable to sit through. This sounds like a person who doesn't like war movies. So why are you here? It would have been nice to get to know a few of the men who were... Who were uh, it would have been nice to get to know a few of the men who were meant to care about. This is from... Uh, E. Philip and Critic. Uh, you do. The entire beginning movie. You're getting to know General Garrison. You're getting to know Sergeant Everest. You're getting to know the character that Eric Bana plays. I haven't seen this movie in a while, so I can't remember all the characters' names. You're getting to know the character that Ewan McGregor plays. Because he's, he's a typist. He doesn't get to go out in combat. And then when he goes out there, he's incompetent, and you feel for him. He fucks up, which adds a little humor, because he's incompetent kind of funny. But at the same time, you feel for him, because he's put in this dangerous situation where something went wrong. You feel bad for Sergeant Everest, because he wasn't supposed to be in charge. It was supposed to be somebody else, but they were epileptic. So then he's in charge, and he's obviously nervous about it. Because this is his first time being in charge of a group. Wasn't their first time out on missions, but it was his first time being in charge of a group. And then what happens? Something fucks up. And the mission doesn't go the way it's supposed to. So now, his first time out there, he's not experienced in leading the group. He's an experienced soldier, but not experienced in leading the group. Therefore, he's having a tough time. You feel bad for General Garrison because he didn't tell Washington that he was going out and doing this mission. And he, it fucks up, and he's almost powerless because all he can do is just watch from a circling drone or a circling helicopter. And all he can do is try his best to guide the mission. Some of the characters out there are getting hurt. Are getting damaged. But they still have to go save the pilots that got shot down. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, here's another review. From Time Out. Does a reasonable job sketching the complicated and contradictory political context. But attempts to bring in the odd Somali perspective are grossly inadequate it's not attempting to give you the somalian perspective it's the perspective from the soldiers just like the book because the book and even the video game delta force black hawk down is from the soldiers point of view they were the ones interviewed it's not about oh jesus as with the real life operation the movie was not very well thought out okay how 
Has the pointless or versimilitude, this from the Daily Telegraph, has the pointless versimilitude of an expensively rendered computer simulation? No, it doesn't. You watch that movie, tell me it looks like a simulation. It doesn't look like a simulation. Star Wars, the prequel trilogy, it looks like a simulation. <clears throat> anyway, so that's just me getting triggered over the critics. Interstellar, a movie by Christopher Nolan. This doesn't have a 12 percentage deviation. It has a 30 percent deviation between the critics and the audience. The critics gave it a 72 percent. The audience gave it an 85 percent. What's going on there? I have no idea. It's a fantastic movie. Go watch it. So, I just wanted to highlight two things. That critics don't know better than you just because they're critics. So you shouldn't let them influence your thoughts. And you should also note that critics have an agenda and they promulgate that agenda through venues that have reached. That's what they do. They want fame, they want power, they want to have everybody else think like them, which, fair enough, I think most people want other people to kind of believe in the things that they believe in. Because when you have principles that are important to you, you want people to see eye to eye with you on them. Why is it different from criti with critics? Why would it be different when it comes to critics? Well, it's not different. The critics are motivated. I would trust the audience score more because chances are the audience is going into a movie the same way you are. And in my opinion, I think the audience, six times out of ten, are right. I think the critics are three times out of ten right. No, okay, I, I would say that the critics, for the most part, are right, but they're not reliable. It's shooting blind. The audience score is at least based on something. There are out there who are defenders of movie critics. <laughs> um, I'll, I mean, and I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed by people who go out of their way to defend movie critics. Defenders of movie critics make this basic defense that I feel is untenable. It's not defendable at all. They, they'll say something like, Movie critics are professionals who have seen a lot of movies, therefore they understand the art better than the average movie goer. They have the acuity to parse the different themes and philosophical inquiries. Now, okay, when I said that, I am generalizing a bit here about uh, people's defense over movie critics. However, I stand by the principle of what I'm saying because I think, even though I'm generalizing, it's still generalize, generally true. Movie critics are often ostentatious sheep from their own ideologies, often, who embellish their their reviews with lexophanic language when speaking in a colloquial parlance will suffice. Do you see what I did there? I made myself sound smart by using bigger words and speaking in a, a lexophanic tone. My parlance was higher culture than yours because I understand more than you do. Because why would I make my review understandable? Why would I point out a specific detail about a movie? That, that makes sense to actually criticize. I don't think that it's insane to think that critics, they have an order of the era. They have their agenda. They have their docket that they believe in. And just like anybody else, if they had a platform where other people look to them, you're going to try to influence the way people think. So why not insert your personal beliefs into a movie? If there's a movie that I don't like or that it doesn't look interesting because it looks like propaganda or it looks politically motivated, this is me kind of playing devil's advocate or being sympathetic to the situation of people who are in the position that critics are in. If I, ha I have my own personal beliefs, I have my agenda, I have my ideology, I have my party line, my activist grievances, my order of the era, my laundry list of things I care about, whatever you want to call it. If there's a movie that looks like propaganda to me, I'm not going to go leave a review about whether or not the movie is propaganda. Because that movie is trying to reach a specific audience. So, I know that my political motivations are going to, of course, 
I mean, I'm not, it's not that I'm not going to review the movie. I'm going to make it clear that I believe this. This movie doesn't fall in line with my beliefs. Therefore, if you're like me, you probably won't like it. That doesn't mean that people who aren't like me won't like it. So here's what's good about the movie, XYZ, blah, 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 blah. You can have nuance to stuff like that. I accept nuance. There's a reason why I'm being honest with you about whether or not I would give a review about a movie that I don't like because the political ideology espoused in that movie are so different from what I believe in. I I reckon that critics are politically and socially motivated. I think critics are the embodiment of the left wing taking over culture. And I'm perplexed how you could have such deviations between critics and the audience. So let me give you one last antidote to solidify what I'm trying to say. To make it more clear. Because I've spent enough time rambling on now. I, again, have always wanted to make movies since the fifth grade. Something I've always wanted to do. So every movie I've paid attention to. To the intricate details of movies. The shots. The story. What the director is trying to say. What the screenwriter is trying to say. The performance that the actor gives. The way scenes connect to other scenes in the movies. Is the movie a properly integrated film? Is it, is it a masterpiece? I pay attention to small stuff like that. The shots. The color schemes the type of shot it is, the the lens that it looks like they're using, the, the field of view, the framing, all things I pay attention to, the small details. And let me tell you, first of all, that you don't need to be a professional movie critic to see something, to, to have the acuity to be able to identify themes and the way movies are made. Uh, being a critic doesn't give you anything. It doesn't give you any sort of uh, upper hand compared to the average moviegoer who wants to like movies. There's a reason why moviegoers are going to go see movies. They like movies. They want to be entertained. They understand the bullshit they're being fed. So that's my point. Let me finish on this. Do not let movie critics influence the way that you feel about a movie. If you're excited to go see a movie, go see a movie. I trust the audience more than the critics. A lot of critics are pretentious, condescending asshats who are motivated by their order of the day, stemming from their laundry list of activist grievances. Have a good day.